Okay, so it should be recording. <clears throat> All right, so what I thought we could uh, do first is go over uh, like finding intervals of increasing and decreasing. intervals of uh, concavity <clears throat> uh, for the function when you're given the graph of the derivative, because that seems to be the area where most students have trouble. Um, not that they don't know what's happening, it's just, uh, it can be a little bit tricky to, to, to visualize like the, you know, what the first derivative test is talking about uh, and some other stuff. So this is where you're given uh, the graph of f prime. And that's the first hurdle to get over is most everyone they'll see, not most everyone, but a lot of people will see a graph and they'll assume that it's the graph of the function even though it tells them this is the graph of the derivative. And so they'll answer it based on if, if this was the actual function and they'll, it'll just make everything incorrect. Okay, so let's make this, uh, let's see, Mason, what's your favorite number? Five. Five? Okay. So go negative five and five. At this point, uh, we'll say it's negative three, negative four. And that will be three, four. And then it's also hitting, hitting the origin. <clears throat> so this would be um, like, quiz seven. Uh, I think there was a graph kind of like this. It might've been a little different. And it was asking, uh, so given the graph of the derivative, where is the graph of f or the original function? Where does it increase, decrease, and so on and so forth? <clears throat> okay, so let's go ahead and do the same sort of thing. Hi, Abby. Oh, yeah, on one moment. Yeah. Can you go with Grandma? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we want to figure out where the function is increasing, not where this graph is increasing, because uh, I saw a lot of people do that. They wanted to tell me that it's increasing from negative three to three. And yes, this graph is definitely increasing on that interval, but that's not what it's asking, because this is the derivative, and I'm asking about f for the function. <clears throat> so the function is increasing when the derivative is what? Would it be positive or negative? Positive. Positive. So when you're looking at the graph, what does that mean? Like what, what should your eye be drawn to? Uh, anything above the x-axis? Yeah. So that's what you want to describe. You want to describe every section or every piece of this graph right here that's going to be above your x-axis. So the first one would be on this tail section over here. So that would be negative infinity to negative five. And then the second one would be this section here, which is strictly between zero and five.
Okay, so then the counterpart question would be, okay, well, where is F decreasing? So when you want where the function is decreasing, it's just the flip. So now you're looking for where the derivative is negative or where it's below your X axis. So now everything that's down here. So now you've got this little valley part. So negative five to zero. And then this end piece down here. So five to infinity. <clears throat> okay, so any questions on these first two? And anything at all, like how do you know that you're supposed to do that? Or why is it a negative five or anything? <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> okay, so quiz seven, it wanted to know the increase and decreasing. Do you remember what Elsa asked? Because there's two um, other things that can go with it. Uh, you might have asked for uh, relative extrema. Yeah. So let's do the relative max of F. And you can only give the x coordinates, you can't give a y. Um, so how come you can't give a y value? Uh, we don't know what the original function is. So, so where we can see where there are relative extrema, we don't know yeah, what that y coordinate is. Yeah, exactly. No, you don't have the graph of f. So if you give me any y coordinates off of this graph, again, that's the derivative. That's not the function. So you don't know that. You know, those are the y coordinates. You just don't know that. <clears throat> okay, so when the function has a relative max, what is the derivative doing? Uh, switching from positive to negative. Yeah. Right. Yep. And when it switches from positive to negative, like if you're looking at values, that's really easy to tell. Um, but when you're looking at a graph, how do you know if it's switching from positive to negative? Like what else, what needs to be happening? So uh, basically positive to negative, what does that mean? So uh, it's the points where uh, looking from left to right, uh, um, the the graph uh, crosses the x-axis from the top to the bottom. Yeah. All right, so looking at your graph, where is it switching from top to bottom or switching from above to below or switching from positive to negative? It would be at x equals uh, negative five. Mm -hmm. And is that it, or is there another one? And positive five. Yeah. Okay, so then the counterpart, the relative min, now it's just a reverse or the opposite, I guess. So the derivative, it's still switching, but it's switching from negative to positive. Or it switches from uh, below. to above your x-axis. And so for this particular derivative graph, that's only gonna do it at one place. That's just gonna happen to x equals zero. 
<clears throat> because now it's switching from negative to positive or from below to above. <clears throat> And that's all of them. You don't have any other x x or x intercepts uh, or anything. We're switching in sign, so that is it for that one. Okay, so now you can actually get with the concavity as well. And again, it's going to be for the function, not for, <laughs> for the derivative. So not this graph. I am not going to just slap a graph on there and ask you where that graph is concave up and concave down. It's going to be a derivative curve if, if you have one. <clears throat> just FYI. OK, so if the, if the function is concave up, what does the second derivative have to be? Pos positive. Positive. All right. So again, you don't have the second derivative. You have the first derivative. So now you kind of have to link it to that first derivative. So if the second derivative is positive, what is the first derivative doing? Uh, uh, the first derivative is, is increasing. It's increasing. So the relationship that the function and the first derivative have, you know, if the derivative is positive, then the function is increasing. It's the same relationship between the second derivative and the first derivative. Uh, so as long as they're one derivative apart, that relationship will always hold. So like if the fifth derivative is positive, then the fourth derivative is increasing. If the eighth derivative is positive, then the seventh derivative is increasing. <clears throat> so now you know what to look for. So now you can go back to your graph and go, all right, where is this graph? If you read it from left to right, where is it going up? So where is this curve or this graph actually going up when you read it from left to right? Uh, on the interval negative three, three. Yeah. Okay, then the flip of that. There we go. Uh, F is concave down. So now your second derivative has to be negative, which means the first derivative is doing what? Decreasing? Decreasing. So now you're going to go back to your curve, your derivative graph, and go, all right, where is this? curve going down if you read it from left to right. So where's that happening? Um, I would say like, uh, you know, from negative infinity to, to negative three, okay. and then also from uh, three onto infinity. Yeah. Mm -mm. All right, nice job. Okay, so there's one more thing that we can get from, from this graph that would tell us something about F. So what's one thing that we haven't, or I haven't asked you about? So this would be like part G. Uh, inflection point? Yep. So the function is going to have inflection points when the second derivative does what? 
uh, changes sign. Yeah. Okay. So that's what the second derivative has to do. So what does that tell you that the first derivative is going to have to do? Uh, change direction. Yeah. Okay, so if you look at this curve, where does this curve actually change uh, direction if you read it from left to right? So where this curve switches from going down to up or up to down. <clears throat> oh, uh, so it switches it in the negative three. Yeah. And three. Yeah. Which should kind of make sense too, because if you look back at where you had your uh, intervals of concavity, that's where those are the X values where things switched anyway. So they should match up like with these. Uh, same with your extrema. They should be a happening where your um, function is switching from increasing to decreasing. So those were all happening with the fives uh, and at zero. So you should have extrema at fives and at zero. So everything kind of has to line up uh, when you string them all together. <clears throat> Okay, how are you guys doing with, with this? You guys okay with it? Um, do you have any questions on that one in particular? Wait, so uh, you just said that the those numbers should line up. So like the critical numbers for the first derivative should also uh, match, should they match exactly like the critical numbers for the second derivative? Uh, no, like the inflection point should match up to the intervals of concavity and the extrema should match up to the intervals of increasing and decreasing. Oh, okay, I, I get it now, thank you. Yeah, so like uh, A through D, those should all line up, and then E, F, and G, those should all line up on their own. <clears throat> right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions on this one? All right, let's take this. So this is, again, the graph of the derivative, not the graph of the function. And I'm not going to give you any values. You just get the curve. Uh, but I can still ask you questions on it. <clears throat> so looking at this graph, <clears throat> and it's the, again, it's the derivative, how many relative extrema does F have? Uh, is it four? Mm-hmm. Mm 
<laughs> so why is it four? Um, because I see uh, four times on this graph where um, where this function crosses the x-axis. Yeah, and you want to look, he's exactly right. You want to look for where it fully crosses it. So this one right here, it doesn't cross over. So it does not give you a relative max or relative min because there has to be a change in sign for the derivative. It has to like fully cross the count. It can't just come up to it and bounce off. It has to completely go across. Okay, and then part B, how many inflection points does F have? Uh, five using those rules we just learned. Which was? Wait, uh, uh, so basically you just look for where this graph uh, changes direction, right? And I think that's yeah. five times. Yeah. So that'd be one, two, three, four, and five. Nice job. <clears throat> All right, uh, I think you're okay with this. Any questions? Just make sure that every time you have a graph of something that you know what it represents because if you, <laughs> if you interpret it differently, it's gonna throw off every single answer that you give. Um, so just make sure that you stop and go, wait, is it really the function or is this the derivative? Uh, and it has to be labeled. Like I have to tell you what it is, otherwise you can't answer the question. <clears throat> All right. Okay, I'm gonna pull up uh, quiz seven for just a second. So I wanted to talk about, uh, I think it was number one. It was the true and false uh, questions. And there were, a couple of versions of it. Uh, so the first version is, um, you know, which of the following statements are true? <clears throat> uh, so number one, uh, if the first derivative is negative, then the function is concave down. Uh, so what do you think? Is that true or is that false? False. That is false. Uh, what would you have to change to make it true? Uh, but you could write if F uh, prime is decreasing, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, or you could say that if the second derivative was negative, then f is concave down. Uh, it, you could go either way. Uh, but the first derivative does not tell you <clears throat> if it's negative. If all you know is the sign, it doesn't tell you anything about concavity. Okay, the second statement, if the second derivative is positive, then the first derivative is increasing and we just talked about that one so is that going to be true or false uh, 
true. That is true. Okay, and then the third one, uh, if the second derivative switches from positive to negative at x equals c, then f prime has a relative min at x equals c. Can All right, sounds about good. That one too. It is, yeah, I'll send you a message. Um, so if the second derivative switches from positive to negative, oh wait, no, that was backwards. From negative to positive, that's what it said, at x equals c, then the first derivative has a relative min at x equals c. So would that be true or false? True. That would also be true. <laughs> All right. So the true statements would be just two and three. Okay, and then the other version was which of the following are false? Okay, so the, that was similar to the first one. If the second derivative is positive, then F is concave up. True. That is true. Okay, and then the second one, if the second derivative equals zero at x equals c, then f has an inflection point at x equals c. Like, and if you had this one and got it wrong, you automatically know what the answer is. <clears throat> so do you think it's true or do you think it's false? Uh, that's true, right? This is false. So this is where it can be a little bit oh. trickier with the inflection point, but that is how you find where they are. Cause you, you get the second derivative, you set it equal to zero and then you solve for X, but that's not where you stop. Like you don't just automatically go, Oh, those are my inflection points. What's the next thing that you have to do once you get your solutions? Sign chart. Yeah, you gotta do the sign chart. You gotta test them and see if the second derivative is switching in sign at those values. Cause sometimes it, it doesn't switch, which means you don't have a, an inflection point, even though the second derivative was zero there. So just because the second derivative is zero, that doesn't mean you have an inflection point. A lot of times, you have one, but it's not guaranteed. So you gotta be a little careful with that one. Don't just set the second derivative equal to zero and call it a, call it a day. You gotta do that sign chart. Okay, and then the third statement, which is a lot like this one, second derivative switches from positive to negative. Oops. 
at x equals c. Then the derivative has a relative max at x equals c. So would that be a true or false? Uh, does it say relative max? It does say relative max. Then I think it's true. Yep. Yeah. So the only false statement was that second one. Okay, so on that quiz, that was probably the most commonly missed question number one on both versions. The rest of it seemed to be pretty good. Just a couple of little math errors here and there. Or any, do you guys have any questions on either of these questions? Or why something's true, why something's false? Okay. The other place I saw an error was in a, a, uh, was in one of the limit questions, uh, and it was something like uh, the limit as x goes to infinity of let's, uh, thirty x plus four all over the square root of 25x squared minus seven, something like that. And uh, from what I saw, like it, it wasn't that people didn't know how to evaluate it per se, they just, neglected something that was in there that affected the answer. So with these, you know, you're still paying attention to the highest power, even though there's a radical in there. Um, and then the trick was you were taking the first term and you were square rooting it. So like this term here, if you square rooted it, would be five X. And what I saw several people do is they only wanted to root the x squared. They didn't take the, the coefficient with it. Um, <clears throat> and so they gave an answer of 30, uh, or in some cases, 30 over 25, uh, just because they didn't square root or take the 25 <clears throat> into account. So now that the powers match up, it's the, ratio of the coefficients, so it'll be 30 over five to give you six. <clears throat> so if there's a coefficient in there slapped in front of the term or in front of the variable, you know, take that with it when you square root the thing. <clears throat> All right.
All right, let's talk about um, Rolle's theorem for just a minute. Uh, what are the conditions for Rolle's theorem? So like you're given a function in, the, in an interval, uh, what needs to occur in order for you to apply uh, Rolle's theorem to that function on that interval? Mm. So it needs to be continuous. Uh, what does? The function. Yeah. Okay, and what does that mean? <clears throat> Like no holes or skips or yeah, anything like that on the graph. Okay. Uh, the second one. So or differentiable. One. Yeah. And what does that mean? Like you can take the derivative and it's not gonna be undefined on the interval. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so if you find what the derivative is, if you can plug any value that's in that interval and it comes out fine, then it's differentiable. Another way to look at it is, uh, is the derivative itself is the derivative continuous. <clears throat> uh, so you can go either, either way. And that's on the open interval, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so continuous on the closed, differentiable on the open. So the, the derivative part, um, it's just strictly in the interval to ignore the endpoints. Okay, and then what's the third one? So f of a is equal to f of b. Yeah. So if all three of these conditions hold, what does that allow you to do or assume? Uh, you can assume that there is one number between A and B, one X value between A and B, uh, such that its function value will be equal to zero. That's really close. Not where the function is zero, but where the ah d uh, derivative yeah. is equal to zero. Yeah, my bad. No, you're good. I was just reading from the from the notes, and uh, <coughs> yeah, my bad. Uh, okay, so let's see. Does Rolle's theorem uh, work or can you apply it to, let's go f of x is equal to <clears throat> tangent of x on the interval from zero, <clears throat> excuse me, zero to pi. So you're just running through your three conditions and if they all work, the answer is yes. If any of them say no, then your answer is no. So is it continuous on that interval? Uh, yes. Okay. Trig functions, at least for me, I just kind of go back to the graph as long as it's just really an X and the angle. Uh, do you remember where the asymptotes are? 
Oh, wait. Is it negative? Is it negative pi over two or is it? Yeah. And then the next one right would here. Be pi over two. Pi over two. So and then it's got another piece. Yeah. So right there. I might have to change my answer. Yeah. <laughs> I always get tangent and cotangent messed up for some reason, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a big old vertical asymptote at pi over two. So that would be new because it's not continuous there, nor would it be differentiable. And so both of those mess up. If f of A does equal F of B. That's totally true. But the first two, it, it destroys it. <clears throat> All right, let's try secant of x on uh, five pi over six. So seven pi over six. So you can use the unit circle or think of it. Uh, you could use the graph of secant. Um, so again, check to see if it's continuous or differentiable. Well, secant is the is the uh, like inverse of, or uh, secant, you'll draw in the cosine graph, right? And cosine of mm -hmm. pi is a negative one. So if you drew out that graph, then you would have, you're basically talking about around the point, um, you know, uh, pi negative one. And I think it will be continuous there on right. that interval. Do you remember where secant is, the first place that secant is undefined or where it has its first uh, vertical asymptote? Uh, should be pi over two, right? Mm -hmm. Alexa. Yeah, I guess that's good if you can just remember where the asymptotes are. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the first one. Where's the next one? Uh, th uh, three pi over two. Yeah. So five pi over six and seven pi over six, <clears throat> um, they're down in here somewhere. So on that section of your curve, you are definitely continuous. So that's just on that little hill part. So it's continuous. Um, the derivative of secant is secant tangent. Uh, you could also look at this graph here too. Uh, there are no sharp points. There's no vertical asymptote in there. So this curve definitely has a derivative everywhere. So that's good. And then you just have to go, okay, well, does f of a equal f of b? Yeah, looks like yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because then you just stick in the two values, stick them both in the secant, and they equal each other. So that would be a big old yes. <clears throat> All right, nice job. Any questions on this one? All right. <clears throat> um, so in that same section, they talked about Rolle's theorem and then there was another theorem they talked about. What was that? The mean value theorem. Yep. Okay, so what were the conditions that had to be true or that had to hold so that we could actually use the mean value theorem? 
so f so the function has to be uh, continuous on the closed interval a b and i guess uh, differentiable on the open interval a b yeah Okay, so almost exactly like the uh, roll theorem, you're just leaving out the f of a equals f of b. <clears throat> okay. If the mean value theorem applies, then uh, what do you get to do? Well, you get to do some math. You get to set up that equation. Uh huh. Um, so, so I mean, the equation is like uh, the derivative. So f prime of c, um, and I guess uh, uh, c will be a number in between a and b, right? Uh, but f prime of c uh, equals f of b minus f of a over uh, b minus a. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so then for some C uh, in, uh, and is it the open interval or the closed? The open interval, uh, yeah, open interval, right? Uh, are you sure? Uh, well, I'm looking in the notes and we have, there exists a number C in, and then we have uh, parentheses, A, B. So is that correct? The open yeah. interval? Okay. You just didn't sound 100% sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So this should kind of make sense a little bit as far as the, the equation, because what is a derivative? Slope of the tangent line. It's the slope of the tangent line. So basically that's what the mean value theorem is, is kind of saying. They've just taken the derivative and made it equal to a slope, which is what we've practically been saying all along, the derivative is the slope. Uh, so that's what you've got right here. <clears throat> okay, so it's kind of the same type of thing for Rolle's theorem. You got to run through your checklist to make sure that it works. Uh, and then if it does, then you can go through, go ahead and follow um, that thing. And if the answer is no, then you can't apply the theorem. <clears throat> uh, so it usually wasn't too too tricky to, to do. <clears throat> okay, do you guys have any questions on uh, Rolle's theorem or the mean value theorem? Okay. Um, let's go ahead and talk about absolute extrema. <laughs> um, so this is a, a, a quiz question, um, but just to kind of go back to it, what's the difference between absolute extrema and relative extrema. Like, how do you know when you have an absolute versus when you have a relative? Uh, well, you would be looking at uh, a, like a graph, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. And I would say like the absolute extrema will be, um, you know, the highest and lowest or the highest and the lowest point on that yeah. graph. Yeah. Relative extrema. They could be the highest or lowest point depending on the curve, uh, but relative extrema doesn't really take into account 
how high it goes or how low it goes. Relative extrema occur when there's a change in your direction or the, where the derivative switches in sign. It has nothing to do, or none of that has to do with the absolute extrema. Um, so if I give you a function in an interval, how do you find where those absolute extrema are? It's easy to do on a graph, but what if you don't have that? So uh, you find where the derivative uh, is equal to zero. Um, and so you get those numbers. Uh, and then uh, you just said that you'll give us a, an interval, right? So then also take the endpoints of that interval. And now you've got like, you know, uh, uh, at minimum, you know, three numbers probably. Anyways, you have like your numbers and then you put them on that. Oh, oh, and then you plug in those numbers to the original function, right? And you'll get some values. Oops. And then you just compare them. Yeah. So, uh, Professor? Yep. So, um, if you have just like a function and, uh, you know, it's not um, on some interval, like the domain is open and you don't give us an interval, mm -hmm. uh, does that mean like absolute extrema don't exist? Like, like um, if, if both ends of the function go out to infinities, let's say, then do you have no absolute extrema or? Um, it, it depends uh, for, I would say most functions that's probably true, but there are some functions like polynomials or like absolute value where there could be one of them. Um, so like a parabola, the quadratic, that will have an absolute min or it will have an absolute max, but not both. Ah, uh, yeah. But um, uh, X cubed then yeah. wouldn't have either. Okay, mm -hmm. got it. <clears throat> Okay, so he, he basically just laid out the whole um, game plan for you. Uh, so plug those critical numbers and the endpoints into the original function. Don't plug them back into the derivative. What happens if you plug a critical number into the derivative every single time? Uh, why don't you just get zero, uh, zero for the critical numbers? You get zero or undefined. Yeah, because that's what you just solved the derivative for. Um, so don't plug them back into the derivative because you already know what it's going to equal. Um, plus, you're not asking about the derivative. You're asking about the function. <clears throat> so plug them always back into the original uh, and see. Uh, what the highest and lowest values are. Uh, typically, if you're looking for y coordinates, you're always going back to the original function. You're not going back to the derivative. <clears throat> Just FYI. <clears throat> Okay, so this was in so either 3.1 or 3.2, and then they didn't really ever talk about it again until it came back into 3.0, sorry, uh, 4.1 or 4.2. Uh, and then it came back um, when we got into 4.7, which was that optimization stuff. So that was really all those word problems and stuff. That was really just your absolute extremist stuff. Uh, you just had to. A lot, oops, a lot of times come up with your own function. <clears throat> but then you still went through, you found the derivative, you found the critical numbers, and then based off your critical numbers, you're like, okay, well, what would give me the maximum or the minimum of whatever the situation is? <clears throat> uh, okay, so we've talked about... Oh, let me, let me talk about one other thing real quick. Uh, finding um, 
increasing, decreasing, concavity, uh, extrema, and inflection points. Uh, by hand. So where you're given a, a function like f of x equals sine or f of x equals x squared plus two, uh, something like that. So this is where you actually have to find the derivatives, set them equal to zero, go through all the sign charts and stuff. Um, I need to see all of that stuff. <clears throat> um, what some people are, are doing, which is a little suspicious, uh, is I'll give them a, a function and they'll, and it's somewhat complex, say like f of x is equal to, you know, x minus one over x minus four. And then they just tell me the derivative is da 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 da. They have no work to support it. Then they say something about the second derivative and they do the same thing. They just kind of spit out a function. I need to see the work that gives you from the function to the derivative and the work from the first derivative to the second, I need to see how you're setting them equal to zero and solving them. <clears throat> like you got to justify and show your work for this stuff. Um, otherwise your answers are unsupported and it looks like, especially since it's online that you weren't actually doing things yourself uh, so show your work, show those steps, especially if you get something wrong, um, then there's nothing for me to grade and go, well, maybe it was just a negative sign. Um, but you got to show that you know what you're doing. Um, you got to prove it. <clears throat> so just spitting out a derivative, just writing it down with no work, that's unsupported. Being like, well, um, you're basically an attorney trying to prove to me that you know what you're doing. Um, you wouldn't represent your client and go, well, he's innocent because he's innocent and not say anything about it. <clears throat> you got to prove it. That's like what the geniuses on Calc Chat do. Skip from, yeah. from yeah, one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, where there's like a 17-step derivative and they take two. <laughs> yeah. I know sometimes the cow chat's like really useful, but then other times it is so not. I'm like, this is not helping. <clears throat> they need to see the algebra. Uh, okay, so. All right. Um, what stuff do you guys want to ask about? Uh, I had a question on, I think it's 4.6 uh, with all the curve sketching. Sometimes like in the book, it asks to find the intercepts. Do you find the x-intercepts with um, Rolle's theorem or just by making it equal to zero? You, I would just set the function equal to zero. All right. <clears throat> uh, also regarding uh, that curve sketching, um, mm -hmm. I was like uh, finding, yeah, the x-intercepts. Uh, I just want to confirm, we don't have to, uh, we're never going to have to find an oblique asymptote, like the equation, right? No. Mm -mm. Okay. And also, uh, I think I think the book was was also listing the y-intercepts. Do you want us to do that too? Um, if it asks for it, yeah. Um, it's like, Usually I would, I personally only ask for the X's. Um, if you give it, uh, I mean, that's totally fine. I wouldn't ding you for it um, unless you got it wrong. Um, gotcha. To me, so the, the, the stuff that's most useful is the, are the X intercepts, um, but not all the time either. Uh, so if it asks for it, just, just, Whatever it asks for, just give that. Got it. Cool. I mean, you can give more than that if you want to, but just make sure everything I've asked for is there. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, but yeah, definitely no oblique asymptote stuff. Uh, so the type of things I would ask you on the exam would be, uh, or as far as sketching it, uh, would be to sketch like a polynomial, um, a rational function, uh, where it would be something like x minus one all over x minus two, something that's not terribly crazy, um, where the derivatives won't take you 85 steps to do. Yay. That makes sense. Um, trig functions. I, I don't think I would ask it on those because that way you could just use pre-calculus for um, or trig. So it's mainly limited to like polynomials and, and rational type functions. So polynomials, something like this, um, uh, like one over X minus five, something that would probably still require some derivative work. You may have a pretty good educated guess as to what it looks like, um, but you still have to run through everything and show that you know what you're doing. I do have um, uh, a couple, I, I have like two questions from that 4.4 homework, which was the second derivative test. Um, if we could go go through either of those. Uh, sure. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'll get the, the page numbers uh, or, or uh, did you want the page number or just like, I, I can read you the question also. That's yeah, just the question's good. Okay, uh, so basically, um, so this was number uh, 57 on that 4.4 homework. And um, uh, I think it's just asking for us to basically do that second derivative test and find, um, you know, uh, all the stuff that you just mentioned. So like uh, uh, where it's like increasing, decreasing concavity, um, uh, inflection points, all that stuff. And, um, oh, and, and then use the second derivative if you could. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that function was um, arc secant of x minus x. Uh, so arc secant of x by itself and then minus x. Okay, so like that? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, so what's the derivative of arc secant? Um, let me rack my memory. I mean, my <laughs> notes. It's... Um, and yeah. anyone can answer. It's u, uh, u prime over the absolute value of u times the square root of u squared minus one. <clears throat> so I think I ran into trouble because uh, I because you know uh, I did that. And then now I'm trying to find critical numbers, I think. And so I'm trying to find where this is equal to zero. And uh, I just like couldn't do it. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, yeah. You couldn't. Okay. So one, one thing to know about, about these uh, is when you're trying to find the critical numbers and you've got uh, fractions involved, especially you know, more than one, um, you need to combine everything into one fraction. Um, because if you don't, like you don't want to just, in this case, like move the one over and then cross multiply and get rid of the fractions. You want to keep the fractions in there uh, because you're looking for where the derivative is zero, but also where the derivative is undefined. Um, so if you eliminate your fractions, like if you get rid of all the denominators, you're possibly eliminating some critical numbers uh, or where the derivative would be undefined. So you got to get everything smashed together. Got it. You know, for some reason I, I didn't do that and I did what 
I think I did what you just said, which uh, what you just said that we shouldn't do, which is move the one over. So, uh, so yeah, that was well, the it's tempting because that's how you've been taught to do it. Um, it's especially tempting because it, it looks easy and this is a long homework assignment, but uh, okay. I, I think that was the yeah. problem. So I, I could probably take it from here. Okay. So yeah. So now once you get everything combined into one fraction, then you're looking for where the top is zero. But then you're also looking for where the denominator is zero. And sometimes they give you the same values, uh, but sometimes they don't. It just, it just depends on, on what you have. <clears throat> um, also, I wouldn't give you one like this like an arc secant or something where you have to find the derivative of an absolute value uh, beyond maybe looking at its graph. Yeah, for this, don't you end up having to like, if you assume X is some positive number, then you can set it up like, like usual, like one minus X times X squared minus one. But don't you also have to consider if X is negative then you would switch that sign, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, finding the derivative of an absolute value to me is one of the more annoying things. Um, and it comes up so rarely that it's just kind of a pain just to go over and expect people to know. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I wouldn't give you a question like this. <clears throat> if it was arc sine or arc tangent, sure, but I'm not going to give you an arc secant question. <clears throat> well, well, thank you. Sure. Uh, uh, so if that's if that's good for that question, then I also had another issue on a problem, and this was on that same homework, and uh, I don't know if we'll need to go over it or not, but it was. Uh, it was number 79. And basically, I don't know if you remember this one. Uh, it's like a word problem. The aircraft glide path, right? Um, where you have like an airplane um, that's like, mm -hmm. the, yeah, it's descending from like one mile away uh, or, or one mile up and four miles away. And they want you to, um, oh, um, find the cubic function on that interval that describes the, the glide path and also um, find the point at which the plane would be descending the, the, at the greatest rate. Okay. Um. Let's see, do they give you some values in there or something? Um, they give you that um, just that the airplane is one mile up and it's uh, four miles uh, west. So I kind of just, yeah, drew out those. And I think that's all they give you. Let me, let me check. Um, uh, th they also say, um, you know, find the cubic function f of x equals, and then they give a generic function, ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. Um, on the interval on that and it's a closed interval negative four zero and uh that's all the hints they give you okay so okay, so yeah they're looking for for that polynomial <clears throat> yeah so there's a way to cheat at it <laughs> um <clears throat> it if you remember like your um if you took algebra 2 in high school or like math 120 uh math 370 um like all those classes go over like how to graph uh polynomials uh, especially cubics um, one like this. So it's kind of nice that they told you it was a cubic function because 
the plane is taking this path and that's what they drew right this is the shape yeah pretty much uh-huh yeah. so if you were gonna like draw the rest of the function it would do something like that yeah and it would have to because it's it's a cubic so this would be like the maximum or like the top so the rest has to go down and then this has to go up <clears throat> yeah so i mean it seems like uh because i guess they're asking where is it descending at the greatest rate mm -hmm. it, i mean it, it, is that where you're getting at um no i'm getting that to where we can knock off some of these values oh okay and then get into that so the cubic function the whole thing it's going to have an intercept over here and it also has that intercept right there at the origin, but this one is special because it, it hits the origin and then it would like it bounces off. I'm not saying the plane's gonna do this. Just <laughs> this is the the rest of the curve. <clears throat> so if you wrote it out, this so I can't see that. We don't know what this is, we'll just call it H. So when you represent that uh, intercept as in the function as a factor, it'd be X minus H, this would just be X for X minus zero. But because it bounces, it's a double root. So it's squared. So then if you expanded it, oops. Oh, oh, you're writing the, yeah, the zeros with yeah. their multiplicity. Yeah, you just okay. take your yeah. zeros and stick them back and get you get the function. So the function only has two terms. It only has the x to the third term and it only has the x squared term, which means that you just found out C and D because they can't be there. So they're both equal to zero. So you can knock both of those off and now you can start going through uh, and finding out um, the, the rest of the problem. <clears throat> so they, what was it they wanted to know what and what? Um, yeah, to, uh, first uh, to find the function that describes the glide path. And then also uh, to know, I guess, uh, oh, they say know where the airplane is descending at the greatest rate. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, okay, so they said it was four miles west and then one mile up. So when F is, or when X is four, that's going to equal one. <clears throat> uh, and that's, kind of all we can do with the function. So now you can start talking about the derivatives. So the derivative of this function would be 3a x squared plus 2bx. <clears throat> and if you plugged in, say, uh, x equals four into that derivative. What would it have to equal? If you plug in four to that derivative, mm -hmm. uh, well, if I just look at the at the graph that you drew um you know the derivative should pretty much equal zero right yeah okay um <clears throat> which means that b is going to equal negative 6a so are we solving this as like a, a system of equations um yeah kind of because you've got a and b and a and b 
Um, the same would be true if you plugged in like f prime or um, if you plugged in x equals zero into the derivative, because that would be your relative min. Um, but that one's not all that helpful because it knocks out the a and the b. Yeah. Which doesn't really get you anywhere. But now that you know that b equals negative 6a, you can go back up into here. Plug in that negative 6a into the b. And then solve for uh, for your a. So what's uh, 16 times negative 6? Uh, negative 96. Mm -hmm. And then plus 64. Plus the 64, uh, uh, 32. Cool. Oops. <clears throat> and so B uh, uh, what six times uh, negative six times that so six six so one uh, three sixteenths. Okay, so that's so that's it. So that's the equation, right? Yeah. So now you've got your function. So you're... Even though it's got these crazy fractions in there. Yeah. So now, uh, I mean, if we were going to continue, um, would you would you have to? So, so you want to know where it's descending uh, most rapidly? Is and that's what we're going to do next, right? Mm -hmm. So would we have to find the inflection point? Yep. Is that going to be the greatest? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So if they want to know something about the greatest rate, that means you're working off the second derivative. Because what, what it would the first derivative give you? That just gives you the rate, right? Yeah. So you got to get the rate and then they go, okay, well, what's the maximum or the greatest of that? So another way to say it is like the, what's the largest velocity. Well, anytime you want the largest or smallest of something, you need to get that equation. So if they want the largest velocity, you got to first get your velocity equation and then you can take its derivative. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so we'll be doing basically the, yeah, finding the second derivative here and finding that inflection point. Okay. Yeah. That sounds doable. I mean, we probably don't have to do it out unless you really want to. Um, Seems a little inconvenient, maybe. Yeah, so then just let that equal to zero. And my guess is, is that it's going to come out to two because that's right in between <laughs> zero and four. Yeah. I'm not guaranteed, but a lot of times the questions in the book kind of work that way. Um, which is kind of nice, but but yeah, if they want to know, okay, well, what's the largest rate or the maximum velocity or the minimum rate, you better get the derivative and then take the derivative of that to continue. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you're right. It is uh, it is two miles. Yeah. Okay. Where is that? Ah, dang it. I think that was on the study guide. Not this question, but that concept. Oh, good. Yeah, I haven't I haven't done that yet. Okay. Well, thanks for going over it. Um, I think.
that it's not. Next one is not. Oh, it sort of is. Number 16 on the study guide. Yeah. Um, says the maximum acceleration attained on the interval. Da, 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 da. Um, so if you want the maximum acceleration, what do you have to find first? Uh, uh, position and or velocity first. Uh, no. I mean, I mean, maximum acceleration. Well, the uh, acceleration, isn't that the derivative of velocity? Oh, I, I see what you get now. Um, yeah, you, you, I mean, you eventually got to get to acceleration. So you have to have acceleration sitting in front of you and then you can take its derivative and keep going. So like for that question, they give you velocity, t to the third, minus three t squared, plus 12t plus four. So yeah, if you, if you don't have the function that they are asking for, then you better get that function uh, before you start solving things for zero. Okay, so get your acceleration. So in this case, it would be, and anyone can answer, So if this is your velocity, what's your acceleration function? Is it the derivative of that? So it would be three T squared um, minus six T uh, plus 12. Yeah. Okay, so this is what you're trying to find the max of, right? Yeah. So whenever you want to find the max or the min of something, you got to take that something and find its derivative. So what's the derivative of that three T squared minus 16 plus 12. Uh, six T minus six. Then you can set that equal to zero and solve for T. Uh, so T is gonna equal one. <clears throat> okay, so now that you have uh, an answer for T, what are you gonna do with it? You're gonna plug it into the derivative, into acceleration, or to velocity. Acceleration. Yeah. So if you plugged it back into the acceleration function, you have what, three minus six plus 12, which equals, Nine, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Oops. This is not. Okay. Do you have to test anything else? Oh, um, the endpoints of that interval. Mm -hmm. So we got to test t equals, where we go? Zero and t equals three. So when t is zero, acceleration is just 12. 
And when she is three, so we have 27 minus 18 plus 12, which is gonna equal 21. 21. <clears throat> so that's gonna be the max acceleration on the interval from zero to three. <clears throat> Cool. Does the uh, derivative of acceleration have a name, just like velocity's derivative is <laughs> acceleration? It does, and um, you encounter it in physics. Uh, I don't remember where in physics, though. I want to say physics two, but anyways, it's <laughs> it's called the jerk. Uh, but you don't really talk about it in calculus. Good, good. <laughs> there's a, there's enough to do in calculus, so you can leave you can leave the jerk to physics. <clears throat> All right, what else do you guys want to um, want to talk about? Anything from the study guide, anything in general? I had a question about 4.7. Mm -hmm. So uh, I this is from the quiz. I'm not going to give the question, but um, it was fine. It was the... Wait, 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 wait. wait. Uh, you can't give the question either. Right, right, right. Oh, like not even the type? Uh, well, no, because then you have just narrowed it down. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. I will say, like for the 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 quiz and the exam, um, there are like no Norman windows. Um, it's not going to be anything that was on like the more complicated ones um like there's no <laughs> especially a, like a weird shape so no cylinder or, or uh cone um it'd be limited to like rectangles and like a triangle maybe um So yeah, if you've got, um, you, you can email. Uh, sorry, email me about that one, um, and I can work with the work with you one on one. All right, that works. Um, but yeah, I can't just stick it in the video. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, just also with those, make sure you're answering the question. Um, so like if it asks for the dimensions, then you've got to give the dimensions, uh, you could give the actual area or volume, uh, if you wanted to, um, but make sure you're, you're answering what they asked. So if they ask for the area, then you don't have to give the dimensions. If they want the dimensions, you don't have to give the area. <clears throat> um, I don't remember what other ones. So let me stick on there. Yeah, like the one on the study guide is similar to one that was in the notes. Um, 
those would be probably that would be the most difficult it would get so as long as you can like set it up um the derivatives should be pretty simple um, like nothing like terribly crazy <clears throat> you shouldn't have to know like really complex geometric formulas either it's like area perimeter um of like rectangles triangles maybe a circle Oh, here's one that not a lot of people know or remember. Um, a semicircle. I have a radius R. Centered at the origin. That's always going to be y is equal to the square root of uh, r squared minus x squared. Um, so I think the one that we did in the notes, it said I had a radius of 5. So that's how we came up with that equation is y equals root uh, 25 minus x squared. This one comes up a lot in calculus too. Um, <clears throat> so you just got to know how to get that equation anytime they talk about it. <clears throat> And I think the problem was there was a rectangle inside this curve. Uh, so what's the maximum area of the rectangle? <clears throat> so if you study the like this one, um, the one off the study guide, you should be pretty good to go because um, you'll have master whatever the difficulty level is. <clears throat> so do you guys want to go over this one in the study guide? Or are you good? Uh, unless anyone's opposed, I'd be willing to go over it. Okay. Both or just one? Uh, let's start with one. Okay. Uh, do you want the study guide one? Yes. Okay. It's like this one is in the notes, so that one should be there. Okay, so that was number three. 13. <clears throat> so find the dimensions of the rectangle of largest area, which can be inscribed in the region bounded by the x axis, y axis, and the graph of y equals 8 minus. I think that's x to the third. Yeah. So eight minus X to the third, the graph is doing something like that. So it's been shoved up by eight and it's upside down. Uh, and so it's you've got the rectangle, which is bounded by the X axis, uh, the Y axis and the curve. So you've got a rectangle going like this. So the corner is hitting the curve. 
somewhere, just x, y. <clears throat> so what is the, what are the dimensions? I'm gonna give you the largest area. So that means you need to know the area of the shape. So the area of the rectangle would be x, y. Yeah. OK. So if we kind of follow that pattern that was in the notes, this would be like your primary. And then your secondary was one that you either had to come up with um, or it was something that they actually like gave you a value for uh, or they actually just told you what it was. So in this case, that's the situation you have. You know what the secondary equation is because they gave it to you. So what did they give you in that one? Y equals eight minus X cubed. Yeah. So now you know what you can plug in for y into the area equation. And I would just go ahead and distribute it. And this is your area. So that's what you want to maximize. So you got to get this derivative. So eight. Minus four X to the third. Set it equal to zero. So X to the third is going to equal two. So X is going to be the cube root of two. <clears throat> okay, and you don't have any units, so there are no units to worry about. <clears throat> so that you, once the dimensions, so you've got the base of the rectangle, so now you have to get the, um, the height. So now it wants to know the y. So where would you get the y value? Plugging that x into the original function. Yeah. So if you plug in the cube root of two into this, eight minus x to the third, the cube root and the, cu the cube cancel each other out. So it's just eight minus two, just six. So those are your dimensions. <clears throat> so there were uh, um, two other x values that you could test out of this though. One was x equals zero and the other one was x equals two. So where on earth are those two numbers coming from? Anybody have a guess? Is it from setting the primary area to zero? Um, kind of. I guess you could. Um, but it's also what the region is bounded in. So because you're looking for anywhere that's in between here and here. So it's anywhere from x equals zero to the x-intercept, which was two. So inherently your rectangle was bounded in between x equals zero and x equals two. So these are like your two endpoints. Um, they weren't gonna matter because kind of what you just said, if, you, if your x dimension is zero, what does that make the area? Zero. 
zero. So there is no area, there's no rectangle anymore. And same for when X is two, your area is gonna be zero again, cause it would just be a flat line from here to here. So there's no rectangle. <clears throat> so they didn't really come into play anyway, but they technically were possible candidates. Um, they just didn't really ever show up, nor did they affect your answer. <clears throat> which happened a lot with these problems. Like if you only got the one critical number, that typically was the one you wanted um, because of that situation. The endpoints just made whatever it was zero, which didn't really maximize anything. See, what else haven't we talked about? Do you have any questions on um, limits? Like all that limit as X approaches infinity stuff? Yeah, do we need to use those every time? So when we have like, when we're finding the asymptotes, do we use the, do we use those limits every time or no? Um, if, it, if you're looking for a horizontal asymptote, I would. Is that the type of asymptote you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you would wanna do both. So you would wanna take it as, as X goes off to positive infinity. And then again, as X goes off to negative infinity, because you're looking to see if there's two different ones or if they're the same. And then how would we know when to look for that? Or should we just look for that every time? Um, if it's not a polynomial, you're gonna wanna look for it. Because rational functions will have one. Um, and those are the, the two types of functions you're gonna be sketching would be polynomials and rational. So polynomials, if you know it's a polynomial, then you don't have to worry about it. But if it's rational, now you do. Is there another way to find a horizontal asymptote uh, besides for doing that? Um, <clears throat> there's a pre-calculus method that they taught you in that class if you took Math 370. Um, but it's basically, that's really what you're doing. They just don't call it a limit. But if you look at the guidelines, they're practically the same. Um, they just leave out the stuff and they don't really, or they kind of gloss over the situations where, you know, your limit comes out as infinity. Um, <clears throat> but otherwise the guidelines are the same. They just don't attach the limit stuff to it. Yeah, I remember doing it. I, I, I just uh, forgot how we did it. So yeah, uh, I, I guess it is the same thing. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> now you just have notation to use. Yay. <laughs> <clears throat> it's like, but it's important because, you know, there are rational functions that come out You know, if you're trying to graph them, they come out as this. <clears throat> so if you leave the horizontal asymptotes out, then you haven't specified like, okay, well, are these going off to, or going up to infinity? Are they hitting a ceiling somewhere? Um, so you need to, you know, find that horizontal asymptote if there is one. <clears throat> Uh, professor, mm -hmm. uh, sorry to jump around a bit, but I, I had a question uh, from, it, uh, it was from the homework on the first derivative test. And uh, maybe this is something you could answer quickly, but um, uh, we were given like a, a piecewise function um, uh, that has two pieces. And basically we're supposed to do the first derivative test. So find, find, where it's, so find the intervals of increasing and decreasing and uh, relative extrema. Okay. And, uh, for this question, um, um, I found out that the function was continuous. So 
uh, that was good because uh, at that end point, um, we got the same Y value. Um, but I ended up getting the wrong critical numbers. Um, it said that like uh, the point at which the function splits, which was at X equals one, uh, was a critical number. And I didn't, I didn't see how that worked. And um, is there something that like, like uh, that's always gonna be a critical number or, or maybe we could do this example, I don't know. Sure. Um, what is it and from where? Is it uh, yeah. 4.3? Yes, this is a 4.3, it was a number 43 and I can give you the function. Um, yeah. which is f of x equals, um, and then it's going to be uh, two things. So uh, 3x plus 1 uh, for x is less than or equal to 1. Um, and then 5 minus x squared for x is greater than 1. <clears throat> okay. And they, you said they did connect, right? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so the graph kind of looks like that, more or less. <clears throat> oh. So okay. it's a little bit hard to tell algebraically. <clears throat> um, the, another way to... to but visually, there's a sharp point there, so that's why it's a critical number because that's where the derivative is now undefined. Um, the other way to see it is if you actually did do the derivative, the top function is three, the bottom function is just negative two x, but it's still split at the one. Oh, so it's like at the same point and it's two different things. Yeah, so now your left derivative does not equal the right derivative. So they do not agree uh, with each other. If it wasn't, can, well, yeah. <clears throat> so that's how we would figure that out without like graphing it and saying that there's a sharp point, right? We could always just use the first derivative. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, if it wasn't continuous, that's where it gets a, a little sticky. Um, but since it was continuous, you know, it ha if they're not agreeing with each other, then that's the derivative has to be undefined there. Because now it's like you're taking the, the left limit versus the right limit. So the two limits do not agree. <clears throat> yeah. So if, if those y values didn't agree and um, this function were not continuous, uh, I guess we might not have that situation, but um, it's like, yeah, you're not going to run into that one. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I was just wondering if you would always assume that there's a critical point or maybe it's more complicated. So don't assume that it is a critical point. Um, because if the slopes are the same, then it wouldn't. Huh. Um, I'm trying to think of one where. yeah if you had some sort of a situation where it was like it curved and then it kind of kept curving at the same rate or something um there was no sign change in your your derivative per, per se um, or there wasn't a dis there was no disagreement there yeah well if you had like some sort of absolute value function where like you know you have like a slope of one uh, but then like when you cross the y-axis, then you still have, let's say like a slope of one, but it disconnects or something, then yeah, your derivative would be the same, right? Yeah, if it didn't continue in the same direction, um, yeah, now it's a sharp point. So anytime you're like connecting a line to a curve, that's probably gonna be a sharp point. Um, unless, well, right? <laughs> It could have connected a parabola. Like that, I guess. So at that point. Yeah, but then at that point, the uh, uh, the y values are equal if that's where it splits, right? 
Yeah, and the derivatives yeah. would have come out the same or something. Yeah. Um, so like, okay, I think it would be like if f of x was x uh, and then one half x squared. Yeah, now, now it would not be a critical number. Okay, are, are you able to see my, my, my video if I share it? Um, here, I think I have to. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I was okay. going to show you a, 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 a hypothetical example, but it probably doesn't matter that much. Yeah, I was like, send that to me if you want to. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, sure. you answered the question. So thank you. Let's find the inflection. Points, uh, just X values. Of F, if the second derivative is equal to X squared times X minus three. times x plus four. So typically, so this is really shortcutted like a lot of the work that you have to do because to get the inflection points, you have to get all the way down to the second derivative, but that's been provided, which is really nice. And it's also been factored for you, which is doubly nice. So you just have to take your second derivative, set it to zero, and then solve it. So x is going to equal zero, three, and then negative four. <clears throat> so do you get to call it a, a day? Like, are you done? Or do you have no. to do something else? So oh, we we, have, sorry, we had that question before that said, uh, if, if you have a zero for the second derivative, then does that mean it's an inflection point? And, you know, I got it wrong, but the answer was no. Because um, it has to cross the axis, right? Yeah. So it has to switch in sign for it to be an inflection point. Uh, just because you solved it for zero doesn't mean if you're done, you got to test it. So do your little number line sign chart thingy. So we can test like negative five, negative one, one, and four. Can so you, you got to test your numbers and see if there's a sign change. Can you not um, just see them like for a multiplicity of two, then don't you know that 
the that uh, it's definitely going to bounce off the axis. And then for those other two zeros, don't you know that it's going to go through because they already gave it to us? That should tell you that, yeah, uh, if you're savvy about it. Um, but if you're not, then yeah, you just got to run through it. Uh, I will caution you though, you, you, if there's another one that has multiplicity, you might still want to do it just in case. <clears throat> okay. Um, the other thing you can look at too is that you know that since this is squared, this factor is always going to be positive no matter what you plug into it or no matter what test number you stick in there. So you really only have to pay attention to these two. So like when X is negative five, that's a negative and a negative, which makes it a positive. X is negative one, negative and a positive. So that's a negative. When X is one, that's a negative and a positive. So that's still negative. And when X is four, <clears throat> positive and positive. And there you go. So now you only have your sign change at negative four and three. So he was right. The zero did not give you a salute or give you a sign change. So it's not an inflection point. <laughs> Okay, so just make sure that you're testing your values to make sure they're inflection points uh, and also critical numbers. Because um, just because you solved it for zero doesn't mean that it's guaranteed to be something. Uh, make sure you're combining your fractions together. So like if you had uh, something like find the critical numbers. Uh, if the first derivative um, was do this one, one minus one over X. <clears throat> like I see a lot of students do it, they'll set it equal to zero. And then they'll move the one over. Cross multiply it. <clears throat> And so they come out with just x equals negative one and that's it. You don't want to do that because you've neglected some other part, you've neglected half of the definition of a critical number. It's where it's equal to zero, but also where it's undefined. So get everything into one fraction. and then solve for what makes the top zero and solve for what makes the denominator zero. So it'd be one and zero. So if you just did it this way, you know, left out a solution. Um, <clears throat> so just be mindful of that. And then you can still run through your, your test. See that there's a sign change. So when x is negative one, you got a negative over negative, <clears throat> which is a positive. X is negative half. You gotta still have a negative over a negative. <clears throat> Oops, I'm trying to do it out, which is a positive. And when x is two. And that was a positive. <clears throat> so it's always increasing, but you still have critical numbers, just no extreme. Number. <clears throat> okay. 
All right, um, let's see, what else do you wanna know or ask about? Uh, I have like two questions. Uh, the first sure. one is just a general question. Uh, I forget if you said we could drop one quiz score or one exam score. You get to drop the lowest two quiz scores. Oh, okay. Uh, and then the second question was about um, the derivatives of absolute values and how you find those. Um, I'm not going to ask you about them, um, but you to find them, you find where it's like split. So like if you graphed it, it's like this is the absolute value of x minus three. <clears throat> it's split at wherever that point is. So then you just find the slope of this half and then find the slope of that half. And those are your derivatives. So the derivative comes out as a piecewise function. <clears throat> so that's the quickest way to do it. Um, the other way is to remember what that formula is, um, which I told you what it was in the uh this second exam <clears throat> um but to me it's just faster if you just graph the thing and then calculate the slope this way and this way okay <clears throat> uh any Anything else? Oh, um, let's see. Make sure you're also paying attention to the domain of a function. Um, like if it's wanting to know like, okay, well, where are the critical numbers for f of x is it equal to root x minus one? Um, there are some values for x that you're not gonna be able to use. Um, so like, what's your domain? X must, yeah, uh, one infinity. Yeah. So, you know, you can't have any critical numbers that are going to be smaller than one. So if you come up with some, then you got to toss them out because they're not part of the, of the domain. Um, <clears throat> like radicals, L, LNs or logs, uh, trig functions. You know, all those are gonna have some sort of a domain that could affect uh, your answers.
So we talked about both types of extrema, increasing, decreasing. We did stuff with the graphs. We did limits a little bit. Same with optimization. Talked about random general questions. All right, if you have not yet done the study guide, I would recommend doing it. because it was a pretty good overall practice. <clears throat> so we did the role theorem and value theorem. <clears throat> Let's see. The first derivative test tests for intervals. of increasing and decreasing. Uh, is that true or false? True, right? That is false. <clears throat> so the first derivative test itself does not have anything to do with increasing and decrease, decreasing. You can use the results of the test as a consequence, but it's not testing for increasing and decreasing. What is it testing for? Oh, uh, relative extrema? Yeah. Okay, the second derivative test Uh, tests for concavity. Is that a true or false statement? False. Yeah, it's really tempting to want to say true because you're using the second derivative for concavity, but that's not the test. So what does the test actually test for? Inflection points. Uh, no. I'm an idiot. <laughs> so both of them are testing for relative extrema. Got it. So they, they are testing for the exact same thing. There's just two different ways to do it. <clears throat> okay, so let's... Um, We've used the first derivative test a few times. So the second derivative test, what's the uh, criteria for it? So like, <clears throat> like, how does that test go? Wait, sorry, back to what I said. I, I just uh, wanted to make sure. So the second derivative test tests for relative extrema of the original function? Yep. But then you, okay, and then you set, that equal to zero, you said the second derivative equal to zero to find the inflection points? Yes. Is that right? Oh, okay. But that's okay. not the second derivative test. Got it. <clears throat> so if it says 
uh, use the second derivative test to find the relative extrema of whatever, what would you do? First find the, the first derivative. Okay. And the, the critical numbers. Mm -hmm. And then uh, find the second derivative. <clears throat> okay. And then from there? Then um, you would plug them in, uh, plug the critical numbers into the second derivative. And uh, uh, if you get, um, you know, a positive value, then you'll know that that's a, an X chord, an X point where you have uh, a relative minimum and vice versa. Yeah. <clears throat> which is a little counterintuitive um, because if you want something, something comes out positive, your brain wants to associate with that with a maximum, um, but it's flipped. <clears throat> so why is that? Like why, if the, why does it have to be if the second derivative is positive, you have to be dealing with the relative min. Uh, if the second derivative is positive, then uh, that says that the original function is uh, concave um, uh, up. Oh, yeah. wait, 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 wait. Yeah. yeah, I said that right, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, so when you look there, uh, it's... It's intuitive. You see, you can have a relative min, but not a max. Right. And then the flip is true. If it's if the second derivative is negative, it's concave down. <clears throat> so that has to give you a max. <clears throat> Okay, you guys have five minutes left. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, if the second derivative test uh, fails, you know, if you have like a bunch of critical numbers, uh, well, let's say you have like four critical numbers and uh, it fails for like only two of them, um, which is possible, I think, right? Yeah. Then... Uh, then we have to go back to the first derivative test. So uh, will we need to plug in, we, like we don't have to put in all four points, right? We just have to put in no. those two? Okay. Yeah, just the ones where it failed. Okay, got it. Yeah, because you've already concluded about the other ones, so you don't have to do it twice, unless you want to verify it. But <clears throat> Nah, I trust the second derivative test. <laughs> the second derivative test, is really useful in calculus two. It's a little annoying in calculus one, especially when it fails, because it's like, oh, dang it. Yeah, you know, go back to the first derivative test. So I only use the second derivative test when it told me to in calc one, but in calculus two, it comes into play in unexpected ways. And, it sh it, and if you remember it, it can shortcut something a lot, <clears throat> but I can't, it's hard to explain what that is until you actually get there. So would it be best to, to only use the second derivative test when instructed to? Uh, that's what I do, uh, for, especially for this class. Um, <clears throat> that's usually only when I would use it.
because the first derivative test never fails. So I was like, well, I'm just going to use that one. <clears throat> So yeah, so unless it tells you to use it, um, you shouldn't have to, unless you want to. Yeah, sometimes finding the second derivative can be a giant hassle, unless you're, oh, yeah. unless you're a genius who can do it in one step, but. Uh, Calc chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, if you guys don't have any more questions, um, probably go ahead and stop it here. <laughs> if you do have any more questions, just send them to me. Um, and I'll send you a response. Um, so like, but the exams was released today. Um, yeah, until tomorrow night to get it done. <clears throat> Thanks for the review session, Professor. You're welcome. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Glad we <laughs> Thank could. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> All right. I'll see you guys later.